Am I coming through? I am hearing you. You are hearing me. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's anyway. Good, the, good. There's still somebody else at this time of day uh, around. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thanks everybody for, for hanging out and being patient with us. Uh, we we fell into the classic time zone trap of March. So we have we have me in Mexico who does not do t uh, daylight savings. We have you in Europe who do daylight savings differently than all of our friends in the United States and Canada. And we we're trying to look at UTC and we're trying to look at uh, Eastern time and like all these time zones that neither one of you are on <laughs> and we we messed it up We didn't do it right, but that's okay. We made it <laughs> So uh, Simon Staler, uh, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on <laughs> Great to be here Jake. Um, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah uh, Of course, I mean so uh, we've had you on uh, we Martians before so uh, we did a little bit of uh, insight stuff there, but we're going to talk about very, very broad planetary science stuff today because Anthony's not here. Anthony's on vacation. He's hanging out with his family. And so I'm taking over the show and that's how that goes. Um, yeah. So we got lots of stuff to talk about. So, do, do you have drinks? Which do topic drink? do we pick? I, uh, so I picked, uh, I wanted to get actually uh, some space related beer, but then of course in the, in the end this week was a mess and uh, I went to a store two hours ago and the only beer I could get is actually this uh, Dotteur Gap uh, from uh, the Swiss, uh, the French speaking part of Switzerland, which is great. It's a great beer, but it's not space related in any way at all. <laughs> Sorry yeah. for that, but it's good. That's what do you I have? <laughs> okay, I found one that I think I found the perfect beer for this very specific episode. So check this out. Here, I'll flip up the camera here. Okay, so this is like a novelty beer. Okay, so this is an, an okay. ACDC branded oh. beer. A German Australian hot rock. Um. Yeah, German beer. So I got that for you. And I don't know why Thank it's, you. it's German and Australian. So that's fine. Um, and then check this out. So we're going to talk about Mars sample return today. Look what it says on the side. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going for, <laughs> rock or bust. <laughs> oh, and I, have to, I have to ask you about this too. So it says on the bottom here, brewed in accordance with German purity law. Are there some, like, the serious, purity. Are there some like serious beer purity laws there? Like, oh, of you, course. You know there is, I want to hear about that. <laughs> you didn't, you don't know. Okay. I thought you'd been to Germany once a long, a long time, ago. time ago. A long okay. time ago. Because I learned how to drink this... beer in Germany. That's how long ago it was. So. <laughs> this, this, this Reinheitsgebot or purity law is, uh, it's, it's, it's as stupid as it sounds. Uh, it's a 500 something year old law that was just basically you're allowed only to use water and, um, and, um, water and two kinds of, I know, I don't know the English words, Roggen, uh, like hops, uh, hops and malts. And barley exactly. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. Barley and, uh, and, and nothing else. And so it has nothing to do with purity in any other way. It's probably to annoy the Belgians who put fruit into their beer or something. <laughs> uh, and it's, and of course it has, I mean, in a way it has guaranteed a certain level of quality, but let's say a co common denominator um, level of quality because it <laughs> just stopped all innovation on beer in Germany for 400 years or so. And then, and then you Americans came around with the IPA uh, revolution and now, Everybody in Germany needs to, oh, we need to change something about our beer. Unser Bier muss sich ändern. So, so. Well, but the yours is apparently an old school one. And this well, one's a French a one. Here, so. yeah. Oh, yeah, it looks very German. Nice, right? Cheers. Cool. Cheers, yeah. Prost. It's the purity law. I'm so, um, I haven't heard that in a time in a while. I think it got embarrassing for everybody. <laughs> anyway, speaking of things that got embarrassing for any everybody, uh, yeah, Are we well, already at the woodlands? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Simon's very excited to talk about the woodlands. We're going to talk about uh, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference today, uh, which happened a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, and, and you were there. I didn't get to go this year. Uh, I chose not to go because, well, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so I thought maybe we'd do like a little bit of on the ground reporting and hear what you saw. And uh, I guess my first question is, is it still weird there? Is it a weird place? Because I thought they were leaving this, this venue. I thought that it was last year was going to be the last year in the woodlands, but I guess not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, the, the woodlands put in a big effort to keep everybody there. So they converted one of their um, 
big parking lots around um, the woodlands. I converted that to a food court area. Um, so now you can actually choose between uh, like 10 food trucks uh, uh, with different offerings. I mean, you're standing in, in the Texas sun, so it's not really a nice place to be. <laughs> but <I'm, laughs> of course, every food truck is directly attached to a 450 uh, F-150 pickup truck with a, a, a <laughs> diesel generator on its yeah, back so you have like <laughs> 10 of these generators around you and it's um yeah but hey no that's um i think that's the effort that the woodlands the authentic, is putting in uh, the authentic food truck experience right <laughs> i think so generators <laughs> <sighs> No, it's uh, on the other hand. I mean, everybody's of course always complaining a bit about the woodlands, but then I mean, it's a it's a nice climate in spring. Um, that it's just the right size this venue. So it's, I mean, for the people who haven't been there, it's these two floors. Um, it's a Marriott with two two floors, so a big conference. I don't know, big um, halls at the bottom and up, up on the top there are some smaller seminar rooms. There's one big escalator connecting the two. In half of the time years I was there, one of the escalators was not working, so everybody needs to take the, the lift instead, the elevator instead. Um, this year the, the the escalator downwards was not working, so people were walking downwards, and it's really long and quite steep, and so therefore you, people had a drink, and then oh my god, would I fall down and die? Um, no, but it's that, that escalator it's fun. is like classic. That there's so many like you meet so many people on the escalator because like mm -hmm. you're, like you're forced to look at their faces as they come towards you and they're like oh hey are you let's let's talk later and then you know and then you, <laughs> yeah, but the escalator is so long that you it'll yeah. take five minutes to go around and yeah it's a bit like yeah, the, 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 the conference room yeah <laughs> like the yeah, subway yeah. in Moscow or something yeah, that's a... yeah, yeah. no yeah. but it's it's a good venue. It's a good venue. I just, yeah, yeah. was in, in a weird plastic city. So. <laughs> I, uh, I actually got interviewed by a lady from the city council of the Woodlands while standing on this uh, this food court in, uh, in the Texas sun. And then uh, she asked me what I'm doing here. And so I'm standing in front of this big banner that says Luna and Planetary Science Conference. And so I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a scientist. Oh, wow, you're a scientist. Uh, yeah, I work on planets. Oh, this is crazy. Yeah. We are working on planets. It says Lunar and Planet Science <laughs> Conference right there. I mean, and then and, and she claimed it's the only conference where they're putting in that effort with the, the, the food trucks and everything. So mm, apparently they customer, are really trying. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I wonder if the threat of moving got them a better rate too. Maybe that was the, maybe that was the clutch move after all. <laughs> Negotiating one on one. Oh dear. <laughs> it, it, let's say the the complaining about woodlands was less than last year. My impression is that everybody has now accepted that it probably won't move because every other venue will be worse and more expensive. And uh, yeah, that's how it goes. Cool. So uh, yeah, what did you see there? What's what's uh, what's like the one minute highlight from from LPSC this year? Like what what was the big headline? You think? It's difficult to, to to get one big headline because I think there's just so much happening. I mean, there are just so many missions in preparation, uh, missions returning data all the time. I mean, and even like Lucy, for example, and their Dinkenish flyby, um, as, which was just uh, on the way to the Troyans uh, around uh, close to Jupiter, as uh, just doing one engineering checkout while being close to a tiny asteroid and just see that all the instruments are working and all the ops team um, works together. But still, hey, wow, we find that, found that it's, it doesn't only have a moon, but the moon is a contact binary, which means that it's always in exactly the same. Um, yeah, this, this crazy picture where I think they took, like they took several pictures before the nearest flyby, um, before the closest approach. And then this picture was only down and yeah, and that looked like this. And so they said, oh yeah, it's a moon. Uh, and they had figured out that it's, that it's, a, um, it's a binary system beforehand yeah, already, right. but then, but then uh, uh, I think some hours after the, the flyby, actually they got this one final Im image and uh, nobody expected so much, but then, whoop, whoop. wow, it's not only one moon, it's actually uh, two moons. And, and they discussed a lot on whether they're actually in contact or not. I think in the end they agreed that it must be in contact also because the geometry is only stable if it has at least a certain um, connection. Um, 
Yeah, and it was, I mean, that's probably not rocket, uh, or not uh, uh, solar system shaking science, but it's just, it's just cool that such stuff now happens um, yeah, all the yeah. time. Yeah, I know the, the then, Lucy stuff is like, I, I love the, we don't get to do this very much with planets of like this like moment of first discovery where it's just like, you know, like you imagine like the very first Mariner arrives at Mars and it's like, oh, this is what it actually looks like up close. Like we don't get that with planets anymore, right? Like we've done mm. them all more or less like that close. True. So, so but th these asteroids still give you that. It's just like, what's it going to look like? Literally no one knows. We have an eight yeah. pixel blob of different grayscale <laughs> values that we can look at and that's the best we can do. And then you show up, it's like, oh, it's three asteroids clumped together. <laughs> Uh, it's wild. It's so fun. Yeah. yeah or you have to, I mean, you have the, the 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 radar images of the uh, the, the the big dish that collapsed uh, three years ago. So we can't yeah. do any any updates on that anymore. And then um, yeah, it's uh, and I mean to be to, to be very honest, I've never been too excited about asteroids in the first place. But then just as you say, this variety. I mean, you you get to another one, and this is now all <laughs> dust all the way down, basically. And uh, and then of course the deep psyche. Uh, there was this was a interesting um, interesting session as well because I mean, of course they they have moved down the ladder a bit from oh it's a pure it's a the, the metal core of an ancient planet to now it's. It's mostly metal asteroid, and um, at least half of it is metal asteroid. <laughs> and so it's the the LAHM uh, class of the asteroid at this point. Yeah, and, um, yeah. That's really interesting, and for sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I, the, I, I gotta, we have to make a, a call out because I got to say something about these instrument names. I'm so mad about them. The way they, they name okay. the instruments on Lucy. <laughs> Tell me something because I have no idea why they, what is this actually with this L uh, blah blah. Okay, so the best I understand it is that so the the Lucy mission is like largely modeled off of New Horizons. Like there's a lot of the same team members and and the instrument suite is pretty much identical. There is a Lori instrument on New Horizons. What's the other one they have? There's like Lalettes or something and L Ralph or Lalettes, something Lalettes or something like that. But they're all, all the instruments are like basically copies of New Horizons. And so to distinguish them, they added an L apostrophe for Lucy. It's Lucy's Lori. Mm. It's Lucy's. Lo and then you get this Lori thing, which I'm sorry, this is just bad. This is bad marketing. <laughs> I mean, Na NASA should have called the, the off nominal marketing agency before they did these things. And we could have told them how, how bad this is. But that's what we get now, Lori. <laughs> yeah, right. Lori and L Ralph and. Uh, yeah, L Ralph. And, yeah. Uh, Rough. I had always assumed that Ralph Lorenz was somehow involved in that. <laughs> he might be. He might be the, <laughs> the original one. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how it goes. Yeah, no, it's cool. Um, I the, the Lucy thing. I think they what was awesome, by the way, what, what, one thing that was awesome, and just maybe they're doing it all the time, and I never went to these sessions, but I mean, they, they did cross-eyed stereos on the on the big screen. So basically, the all the audience was sitting there and uh, trying to get this cross-eyed thing right. And so everybody was having this, this crazy look for a few seconds. And, oh, I think I see it. No, I don't. Uh, no, I just can't. Were they like magic eyes? Were they like the... the or just no, like no, the, the one... Blue? No, where your where your right eye needs to look on the left screen, and your left eye okay. needs to look on the right screen, and then, and it's possible to do it. it takes a bit of practice, and uh, but it makes you look like a complete idiot, obviously, while you're doing it. <laughs> it's a sitting one. Did you ever have those magic eyes when you were like a kid? Like, did you have those as a as a book or whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm just in the them? in the one age bracket where this was a thing. Yeah, so this yeah. this crazy one where you like see some pattern thing, and right? yeah, and then and then you need to if yeah. you're like loosely like like your eyes kind of like lose focus. You can like sort of um, so there you go. Works mate. So this is like fish, right? The yeah. Fish floating in this one. I don't. I don't you can't I don't see know. it. <laughs> I can't see it anymore. Yeah, yeah sure, but uh, I mean they, they were shops. Right? We could, if we don't have Arecibo anymore, we should put asteroids into these instead, and we can <laughs> make it more fun. I mean, the, the background image can be, or the main, the other image can be basically anything. So the carrier signal, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you could you could take whatever a picture of Mars and hide uh, Dinkinish in it, or uh, that's what I'm talking about. Something. Yeah. We could make a book. 
Magic True. on the planet. <laughs> uh, write that down. We gotta bring magic it back. Magic planet. guys gotta come back. <laughs> this, this is so dated, Magic guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is really one of those things that had a like five year five year window where it yeah. was a thing, and um, then <laughs> yeah, no, no I was there. definitely in that age bracket. Like I got like a book for this, like every Christmas and every birthday. It's like here's your new Magic guys. Like, Ooh, look at all the Magic guys, and that was it. And then yeah, I guess then the internet came and it wasn't a thing anymore. But. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I forgot about that. I think. Yeah. I mean, there were these stores who would sell uh, uh, holograms and maybe some other weird, kindly, kind of esoteric stuff. And, and yeah, yeah. Guys. Yeah. Uh, Mars sample return. Obviously, I'm assuming was a big topic there. Um, I think I saw there was like a couple of sessions on it. But uh, I'm kind of curious. This, this is the thing I'm most interested about because there's you know there's some science going on. There's going to have the They'll do the sessions about the samples and what they're doing with the and why they're picking them and all that kind of good crunchy stuff. But I'm kind of curious to know what it was like on the ground because, like, compared to just a year ago, like things are tense with my sample return. And mm, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious to where see where the scientists stand on it because, like, it's one of those things where, uh, like, everyone kind of agrees that it's like a good. Thing to go after right but the implementation is all over the map and if you're not a mars scientist i'm really curious to see you know what those perspectives look like but i don't know what's your what's your vibe check on the ground for for scientists and i'm a mars scientist so i should be excited but then i'm not a geochemist so i maybe shouldn't be too excited but i was surprised that people had um let's say call it let's say a bit more become a bit more serious about it uh i mean you did see people walking around with shirts like bring them bring the samples back bring uh, them home. they yeah. didn't have <laughs> yeah, bring them home Not they yet. didn't have a uh, rock or bust um but uh and the i mean of course there are now a lot of different um a diff lot of different layers to it so i think Due to the fact that it became so critical over the last year, um, most of the science community has now agreed that we we can't we can't oppose it uh, on the grounds that we'd rather have whatever another Venus mission and also because because now it's really dangerous. Now it's not you just grandstanding. Oh, we should go to Venus more often. I mean, that would be great. And MSR is so expensive. But now it's actually if you as a scientist are complaining about it a few more times then um, then it's not gonna happen and um, so therefore people decided okay I mean if we're now just out of vanity killing MSR then we're really damaging the whole process of the decadal review that we're otherwise so proud on because I mean two decadal surveys in a row have said mass sample return is the biggest science goal um, of at least the American community and also the European and the Japanese to some extent um, community and now we yeah, now we need to live with it and now we need to somehow deal with that situation and so that was there was actually a lot more serious conversation um, about it basically everywhere with all almost all um people even those i mean um, of course you know you, you know paul Byrne, um, who has been <laughs> Been on the show, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Been on the show and quite vocal about uh, correct criticism on MSR. But I mean, for example, in the NASA HQ session, I mean, in the end, um, after one and a half hours or so of Laurie Glazer answering questions, I mean, in the end, he stood up and said, Oh, everybody in the room needs to support my sample return now. It's our thing. We need to support it. Like, Paul. <laughs> It, you changed it's your mind. It's because he put he put his name on the decadal survey, so now he's got to fall in line. Right? <laughs> sure. and, yeah, I mean, I asked him afterwards, and that's what he said. I mean, sure, we can't on the one side say, "Oh, this decadal survey is such a great peer-reviewed process that really that comes out with the one thing that the science community wants." If at the next part we are falling again into all our little fractions on, "Oh no, can we please first do Venus a bit more or yeah. another?" Um, and but of course, on the other hand, it is, it's a tough situation now. And, um, and we were probably, what are we, uh, a few days away from um, NASA's answer to the, the IRB um, report, um, it's coming in soon. which they will, or where are we now? Right now they are receiving the, the, the 
architecture uh, report and they need yeah, to come up with I, an answer within a month or so? I, I honestly can't keep track of the specific milestones because like there's there's so many reports and they all have different acronyms that I can't I can't mm. keep them straight. I'll just wait for when like we'll know when it when it drops. The news will tell us, right? So and then mm, we'll, be able sure. to, we'll be able to know for sure. Okay, now it's ready, but yeah, it's soon. I think it's like it's supposed to be spring, right? So like we're 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 there, yeah. right? So yeah. Yeah, it's coming and, and at least my understanding is that this report is actually then, uh, and it's of course not binding, nothing's binding, but uh, somewhat, somewhat binding document um, that actually tells NASA how to move forward and how to, sorry, how to, how much money to spend this year, how much money to spend next year, and um, whether to pick up the samples in Jezero, pick up the samples somewhere on the Delta, outside, come with one helicopter or two. And the thing is that um, in the current budget, as it was proposed, which is, of course, also, I mean, it has been brutal in a way. It has been a reduction of um, almost 5% um, compared to um, the previous year. Um, and so these, in this budget, in a moment, MSR is not even fully in yet. Um, so nobody has really felt the pain of this budget, uh, as I understand it. But people will feel it once MSR is fully um, budgeted in. And so this is... People were actually quite re surprisingly relaxed about the, the budget situation. I expected a lot more um, controversy. And, and, and Laurie, at the beginning of the NASA HQ session, um, uh, she said, OK, everybody, we do this now. And everybody stays polite. And we ask questions one at a time. And we're not shouting, even if you're unhappy about it. Um, but then everybody was actually super friendly and every, um, super relaxed and constructive. Um, okay. And so I think we're in this together, yeah, and we'll get out of it together, I hope, as a community. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see where they decide to go with it, right? Because, you know, like you said, the criticisms have been very valid. Like, there's just some some wacky ways that they tried to put this together, and it was not working. Clearly wasn't working. It's running over budget and stuff. Mm. So I'm, just, I'm very curious to see, like, so far, NASA has been very, like, sincere and and almost you know very upfront about the fact that it's broken and like shown a lot of at least on paper willingness to change it and i'm kind of curious to see where that ends up translating like are we looking at a completely new architecture are they just going to spread out the timeline are they going to cut you know they're going to descope or they, how are they going to how are they going to handle this in a way that, that gets what we need you know mm. i know some of the some of the advocacy is like very much like yes we need to go get the samples and to be clear we need to get all the samples like don't mm -hmm. don't do this like grab the half of the best one like don't we got we sent a two and a half billion dollar rover there to pick the the absolute best bespoke contextual like you know for years and years and years all these very highly qualified scientists on special teams picked out these rocks don't throw half of them away <laughs> so like there's that whole thing to deal with right you know absolutely absolutely and this was a uh, uh... This was another concern that a lot of people voiced uh, that basically the Perseverance mission would be cut short. Uh, I mean, start with, uh, as you say, do not bring back all the samples or cutting short Perseverance in a way that is the safest option at all to get any sample into the into the uh, sent um, lander. Um, like, for example, driving back to the crater floor in a year or so to, and then stay there and yeah, yeah. maybe drive back and forth 10 meters every week or so so that you don't rust um, but uh, <laughs> but otherwise um, do nothing which is of course the safest option but then then you're losing all the signs of actually leaving the delta or going through the delta and getting into the noachian terrains um, yeah up there where I mean, this is this is one of these things that uh, even though i work on mars so much I, it, it it strikes me only every every other week it strikes me again. I mean, we've never been to the highlands on, on Mars, really. I mean, every mission has basically been on this uh, lower, as a, north of the dichotomy, or at least somewhere in the boundaries terrains. But we've never really been to these uh, ancient um, terrains, which we don't really understand why they formed, why the southern half is so much higher. Um, we see from the, I mean, we, for example, we also find almost no fresh meteorite craters uh, and, and you know, new meteorite craters in the south, maybe because there's less dust and therefore you don't see the blast zone so well. And 
we, also in the Inside Mission, we never found a mass quake from the Southern Hemisphere, um, only one or two weird candidates. But uh, so all the current tectonics seems to take place on the Northern Hemisphere. And it's it's just weird. And we've never been to this place. And it would be great. I and mean, of course, we with Perseverance, we'll only drive a few kilometers into that uh, into that region. But it would still, yeah. it would be the ground truth um, for the first time. And, and yeah, there was this, this funny session about the um, the perseverance results, um, where you had different talks, like four or five different talks, and you know, on the last one or two slides, um, all these they all took a turn to. And by the way, uh, Carthago needs to be destroyed, and we need to go to the uh, Noachian terrains. Um, <laughs> don't cut our mission short. It's it was really this. It seemed a bit orchestrated. This, um, <laughs> Some organizing this. happening. Hey? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, they're right, and it's and this is. Of course, the thing that is so difficult now to, to, to accept about MSR, I mean, I understand it, that they need to make the mission as simple as possible and really not add any uh, crazy extra instruments or something. But then on the other hand, I mean, it's a perfectly good lander that will land and will then, it's basically inside lander upgraded and it will stay there forever. And why can't it carry a meteorological station or a geophysical station with it? Um, yeah, cut on your net. Yeah, I remember. We know the answer. Us, I'm now thinking back to like when we were picking the landing sites and stuff for Perseverance, right? And now I'm remembering they had, there was the there was another landing site candidate that was not too far from Jezero. It was like you know far too far to drive, but pretty close like geographically there. And it was a whole other kind of mission, and it didn't win obviously. But then there was like this in the kind of last minute there was like a hybrid candidate landing site that was like the best of both worlds. I was marketed like a little bit of Jezero, a little bit of the Noachian terrains. And it's like in mm -hmm. kind of in the middle. And if you go here, you can do kind of all of it. And I think that that middle ground candidate is actually drivable from Jezero. So I think that was kind of the plan was to like get out of the crater and just go for it and see if you can in your extended mission, see if you can get there. And that to me, that seems like a smart idea because like, you, you know, like, okay, so there's always like these stories of, of say like the Indian space program or the Japanese space program, they're, they're very good at like taking like a really simple, inexpensive spacecraft and like knocking it out of the park, right? Like, you know, like the, the, the Mars orbiter mission from India was very, very cheap. It didn't accomplish great science, but it was very cheap and it got to Mars and it's orbiting. And then you have like these Jackson ones, like, you know, the most recently Slim's pretty great story. And then uh, Akatsuke and Venus, right? Like these really, uh, Hayabusa was fantastic for the, for the, especially for the price, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think NASA's claim to fame for like how they really get their value is that their missions have incredibly good planning and incredibly good longevity, right? And so they extend mm -hmm. them in such a way that we add so much value after the fact that was not in the original, mm -hmm. you know, quote unquote business plan, right? And I think that's like really clutch for Perseverance. It's like, it needs to get these samples mm -hmm. and set that whole thing up. But man, that rover can do a lot of science still after the mm -hmm. samples are done. And I, I hope that we, I hope that we do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I just tried to see whether I can find a map that, uh, but I, of the landing site where you would see this extra terrain that you can go to. Um, but uh, absolutely, and then of course, in, in way problem is that now everybody's factoring in um, this long longevity, so yeah. it's not anymore. Uh, it's not a surprise. Like this I mean, uh, <laughs> hey, we said we're doing a two-year mission, uh, and then nobody expected us to do a two-year mission, but everybody expected us to do full opportunity and survive for whatever <laughs> thirty years, and then oh, why are you dead after four years already? Uh, you were supposed yeah. to last two years, which means 15 years. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got kind of stuck on the <laughs> expectation game there. <laughs> yeah, yeah so this is, um, uh, yeah, but I mean, Perseverance is, of course, doing great. And I mean, of course, this is, uh, this is one of the chances of being at such a conference that you can actually get an update on the on what these other missions are doing. I mean, of course, a lot of the talks are about tiny details. But then in between, there's always this one overview talk that tells you, oh, by the way, we actually left the, the volcanic uh, planes. And now we're in the delta. And um, we're in this different part of the delta. And so, oh, wow, holy shit, you're really going through. Uh, uh, several hundred million years here and uh, within two or three years I did. Yeah, the um, the Perseverance trajectory, like they're like the course on the, um, you know, on their, their map here, like this thing here, this, uh, this happened really fast, I thought, right? So mm -hmm. like, like, look how, yeah. 
you know, so I, I remember like this, this landing site over here, right? So they landed uh, here, they drove down, came and explored this, and then they went back and then they went all the way over here. And this was like the first sample cache was here, right? And then I feel like uh -huh. after this, the mission really accelerated because they went like yep. so far, like all the way across the Delta now. When was Absolutely. this? This was, uh, oh, they don't have dates on here. Right? Uh, it could have been almost two years ago so, by now or so yes. far. Not... Or where is this? this will tell us. It's all 700. And then, yeah, we're already at, so that was only, you know, that's like a year and, and change, right? So mm -hmm. that's a year and a half. But. True. And the weird thing is, I mean, they, uh, so a person from the team told me that, uh, oh, we automated our driving a lot more and therefore we're faster. But then, then you look at this, this image and it's not as if the, the terrain would look any easier on the second half. I mean, before, before they were driving through this relatively flat, uh, uh crater floor and now they're driving through this crazy uh, delta and they're still faster than before. So I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And they're looking down at it. the poor, cool. poor helicopter in this like ravine here, right? Yeah. Can't get to that. <laughs> that's, that's so crazy that they were even able to to fly into this Noretra, Noretra Valles uh, inlet. Um, yeah, but I think yeah. that the extra stuff is like here-ish. Like that's kind of where yes. the, the extra candidate, whereas like the actual Northeast Certus is, is far enough, like it's over here or something like that, right? Yeah, okay. Like, yeah, I don't know. They True. Do, so. Well, yeah, so this are. is... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is a bit... Deep thought, deep thought, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. On the other hand, then Curiosity, I mean, I, I kind of expected Curiosity to be to be shut down because of the, I mean, because Perseverance is needing a lot of ops and uh, thing. but apparently, no, they're still going strong and uh, they have no indication of being um, shortened, yeah, and they expect to do another uh, 100 meters or so in altitude in the next few, few years. Mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. Yeah, I mean, of course, half of the half of the science team is on both missions, so therefore it's maybe. Uh, but it's still, I mean, I imagine it takes quite a strain on the people to be on two science teams where you actually need to do weekly or biweekly planning. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I remember I talked to um, to Abby Freeman about that. Uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, like the talent problem, right? Because the perseverance pops on the line and everybody wants to go to the shiny new mission that's going to do the sure. absolutely breathtaking sample return science, mm -hmm. right? Like, why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? And um, she said, it, it, I think I remember saying it was like, it wasn't as bad as they thought it would be. Like, you know, they obviously some people moved over or some people are splitting their time, but there's plenty of good scientists out there as, a, as it turns out. So <laughs> the, the yeah, challenge is, is in good shape. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, this, and this is this, of course, one of the things that everybody's worried about now. That uh, I mean, with the the, the ascent lander, is it ascent lander? Is M A L the right Mars uh, ascent lander? There's the M L V, the like the Mars MLV, launch vehicle. And my launch vehicle. He, yeah. Anyway, the, let's yeah. let's call it as so the, the the lander with the crazy the rocket lander, inside. It throws uh, the rocket in the air and, yeah, and then stays there for a second, hovering. <laughs> Great video, great video. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. it's but the, um... Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. The um... no, but I mean, this will. Uh, when will that land realistically? Now in thirty, thirty-two. So there will really be a gap, and and actually, yeah, having people working on EDL and having people. I mean, landing site selection, of course. I mean, you can do that already now, but then I'm working on new Mars missions and I don't know whether everybody has really realized how, how this cadence of the last 15 years where you have a new large Mars mission almost in every launch window so therefore you can expect to have a continuous career in new Mars missions. I mean that is how this gap will uh, affect the whole um, community. On the other hand, maybe one positive outlook from European perspective is that I could actually imagine that this means that JPL has a lot more stakes in this uh, ExoMars landing platform yeah. than um, people thought, because in the end, it's going to be the only American lender on, or US supported lender until 30 or 32. So, um, yeah, I mean, of course, can still be shut down, but uh, yeah, it's not like uh, there, there's no benefit at all to JPL. Uh, to yeah. Yeah, that will be interesting to see how that shakes out. And I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm a lot more worried about XMRs than I used to be. When I, when it first, you know, when the Russia stuff first happened, I was like, it's fine. Like, it's a setback, obviously, but 
there is no way that Europe and the United States are going to let Russia end this mission. Like, that is a, it's like not negotiable. But now I'm like less, I'm less secure about that because we're, you know, the, the, the fiery uh, anger at Russia has like subsided a little bit. Like, obviously, it's still very bad what's happening there, but like, it's, yeah. it's not it's not headline news as much as it used to be all right so that kind of that diminishes right that happens naturally with every news event and then you have um budget problems in the u.s like they are tight there right now and so now i'm kind of worried about it hopefully it comes through and you know u.s should at least be able to provide a rocket that should be in the real house but no, that's kind of how that goes. Probably that's the easier part, yeah. No, and and it was quite prominently on the on the slides of the the budget request from NASA. Uh, I did see that. That gave me hope. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, ExoMars. Again, <laughs> another thing where it would be great to put instruments on the landing platform, but I think nobody's <laughs> nobody's gonna risk that. Uh, nobody's into that. Yeah. So, Simon, can we just send a starship to do all this? Tell me what, what you think of that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And this is something where we, with a few people sitting there, I mean, at one point we, we, we put a few timelines uh, on top of another. And then we saw, um, uh, when is the next, next New Frontiers call? It's not earlier than 26. And then, oh, 26 is also the year when Starship's supposed to bring humans to the moon. Um, uh, did anybody at, uh, at the planetary science division actually factor that in? So can we propose Starship now for New Frontier 5 or, <laughs> or for the discovery calls afterwards? And um, actually I and a few other people, we asked uh, Laurie at various occasions or annoyed her with us by asking her multiple times, Laurie Glazer. Uh, and, and, and she at least acted as if she never thought about it before, which I don't assume she really did not do, but... Um, yeah, but it's a discussion that needs to be start in the end because, I mean, of course, nobody really expect Artemis 3 to happen in uh, 26, um, but who knows when the next New Frontiers call will really be and yeah. who knows when the next New Frontiers mission will be after that call. And so do we really want to propose a mission for 30, that will launch in 34 or 35, uh, basically on an Atlas 5? Um, okay, Atlas 5 is over, but... Uh, on a, <laughs> Yeah. What's the, what are the allowed vehicles? Vulcan, New Clan, uh, Falcon Nine. Um... Well, that, and that's what's interesting, right? Is that like okay? So there's always been this, um, and this is understandable. But you know, for a uh, rocket that hasn't figured out its stuff yet, like you know, Starship's still in development. We're still figuring it all out. Like the planetary science missions generally stay away from those. Like you make your proposals on sure things and established bits. And if you can, you, sometimes you can adapt it later, you know, oh, okay, we designed this for Atlas V, but oh. we can fit on a Falcon 9 and it's cheaper, we got a deal, great, let's go for it, right? Um, but, you know, Starship's kind of a different beast and mm -hmm. uh, they haven't really onboarded that into, the, into that pipeline, I feel like, you know, like even we had the whole Uranus proposal, um, you know, relatively mm -hmm. recently, and I don't think it really, factored in Starship at all to it, right? Like it was all based on, I think it was based on basically Falcon Heavy and uh, uh, Vulcan, right? It was the two kind of rockets it was baseline. Mm. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out, which is normal. But extra variable is that sure, Starship is, you know, quote unquote unproven, but like so is Vulcan mm. and so is New Glenn. <laughs> Even more and so. No, yeah. And there's no Atlas yeah. and there's no Delta Four. True. So, like, if basically is Falcon Nine just gonna run the show? Like, is every proposal for the next like five to ten years just gonna be Falcon Nines? Like, I don't know. I don't know how that's gonna look like, but uh, it will be interesting to see. <laughs> I, I don't know what you what your your feeling is on how long Falcon Nine would be around, even if Starship is is working. Uh, whether SpaceX will continue to keep Falcon Nine for legacy launches uh, or something? I assume they'll I they will want to get rid of Falcon 9 mm -hmm. like as soon as they can because there's no sense if if quote if Starship can do everything Falcon can do and it's the same price or cheaper then we just you do not ever want Falcon to exist anymore like it's just dumb mm -hmm. to maintain a, a, a product line that is completely mm -hmm. like less than all your other ones you know it's like still selling off iPhone 4s for you wouldn't do it so um, I assume that I mean, but the things you have to do for to make that true is also not 
like just to have Starship working. You got to all the launch pad infrastructure, all the customers mm. have to get ready. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen. So I don't know how fast that will be, but uh, yeah, it could, it could be yeah, and then, years, right. And I think this is the thing that, that at least in the, in the planetary community, people also haven't really wrap their head around how Starship will in the end actually work out. I mean, because as it just from the, the, the way, I mean, it's a two stage rocket uh, that can bring a lot, a ton of stuff to Leo, but basically almost nothing beyond Leo um, in its, in a single Starship launch. So uh, in the end, everything will have to be refueling and Leo, then maybe refueling uh, in a mass orbit or some, I don't, I don't know whether anybody actually knows the answer to how you would how you would make a Uranus orbiter mission with Starship. I mean, does it mean that yeah. three Starships need to go towards uh, to, <laughs> towards Jupiter and refuel just before the Jupiter flyby, and two of them uh, go into the Jupiter atmosphere, and the, uh, one continues to Uranus, or and it's completely refueled on its? I'm I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm less worried about that. I, I'm not too concerned about that because I think there's a couple of options for them, right? Like you can solve a lot of problems without mass, you know, like, so mm. this thing can carry so much crap, right? Like it's just such an enormous rocket. So, you know, one, one thought, like the easiest thing you could do is like, okay, so if you have a hundred ton launch capacity and your vehicle's 10 tons, like your payload 10 tons. So just like launch on a escape trajectory to Jupiter, deploy your payload and then turn the rocket around and unlaunch it back into Leo and land, you know, like you, you can have so much fuel that you could just go, you could just cancel out your escape trajectory again. And, <laughs> you know, you could, you could do that. That would be like in the realm of possibility, hmm. add 90 hmm. tons of fuel to it. Or you, you know, you start telling people like you, Hey, when you're making your proposals, stop, stop putting yourself in this brain of like, I got to make a, a mi miniature, tiny scale, hyper mass optimized spacecraft. Like just make a giant orbiter, like make it the size of a school bus and fill it up with fuel and you can, uh. you can fly all over the solar system even while we can launch it. You know, we'll put uh. you on a, we'll put you on a geo trajectory and you take it from there and then <laughs> give yourself three tons of extra fuel. <laughs> you know, there's things like that you could do. I, these are discussions that we need to have and uh, in the end actually understand which, which instruments are in the moment mass limited, but for example, we had the discussion and I mean, could you in the end do absolute age determination on Mars instead of uh, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the stuff on returning the samples to the to Earth to do the absolute um, dating there. And then it turned out that I mean, in, terms, like, in the end, you need to bring uh, something the size of a fridge, probably um, an instrument that size. But on the other hand, all the instruments that exist are so sensitive that there's no way you're going to launch them on a rocket, uh, mm, at yeah. least currently. And so this is what people who were in the conversation said, uh, uh, but then it, it means, okay, maybe we need to develop, um, need to develop the instrument to do this isotope separation uh, that can actually survive uh, the launch on, on Starship or yeah, put like it a, into a configuration. A giant, like, giant, like fun house, like bouncy castle thing that can encase your <laughs> to keep it safe from the vibrations, right? We got so much space and mass, like you, we can have so many interesting ideas. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that, right? What was the, the other idea? You fill it up with some vex that evaporates. Um, yeah, you fill sure, it up with some sure. vex with a really low um, <laughs> evaporation point, and then you open some little uh, hatch and wait a year until all the vex has evaporated. Nailed <laughs> From, it. Yeah. The, yeah. Bounce, the bouncy castle payload adapter. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? I mean, but these are these are the I think these are really the the, the conversations we need to have as a community. And so yeah, yeah we're trying to set up small groups to discuss that actually because um i i mean everybody everybody's starstruck by this this one rendering of a starship standing on the surface of europa which is of course yeah. bollocks or maybe not let's say not realistic but um or maybe it is but uh we need to come up with the yeah with things that are not basically an existing bus uh, with a few standard instruments on it and then uh, send it to venus series or uh, I mean, there's like the, the K2 guys are building, you know, big, big satellite buses that mm -hmm. are designed for those things. And I think it probably wouldn't be too hard. Like if you, if you really had to find a way to like stop gap, like how do we, in the meantime, how do we launch stuff on Starship that's going to make use of this, right? Like, mm -hmm. is it, would it be really so hard to just like strap a Star 48, you know, upper stage kick stage to your satellite and stick that? Like, I think that would be not too difficult of a thing to solve, right? Like, I don't know. 
you tell hmm. me, but <laughs> I don't really know. But I, I can't tell you yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you, as you said, we need to think about it uh, because in the end, I, I don't know, maybe the budget will magically increase. Uh, um, ESA's or NASA's budget will magically increase soon, uh, but otherwise we, we, we do have a certain break now for breathing um, before we think about new missions and then yeah, we might as well take the new options into consideration. Yeah, yeah. And okay. let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's, uh... <laughs> lots of, there's lots of ideas out there. We just got to decide on them yeah. and try them out. Right? And it's, and it, it's an exciting time and you sometimes really forget how exciting it is. I mean, like one older person at LPSC, they, he told me about LPSC, what was it, 94 or so, where the only new data that they have, were having were a few meteorites that somebody had reanalyzed or <laughs> in the mid 80s where they were, Dreibus and Wenke were coming up with the compositional models of Mars, which were also only based on reanalysis of existing meteorites. Um, and yeah, that was all they had. And now we're having, <laughs> yeah, we're having a mission to almost every object in the solar system in formulation or in flight uh, yeah. or already arriving there. 94 was around the time when the Chicxulub crater stuff was happening, right? That's when when uh, we were like locking in the, the, the dinosaur killer crater, right? Because there was always a yeah. thing around, but that's, that's about when they were getting all those like, uh, what was it, mm -hmm. the... the uh, I, uh, uh, iridium samples from all the mm -hmm. AT boundary mm -hmm. lines all over the world, and someone put the, mm -hmm. in the ground. And that Mexican uh, oil company, like the guys yeah. pulled the, the core out of the ocean and the, in the crater, and they found it. And, yeah, I think and that's I think where you're it, living now. Cool. Yeah, so I'm inside of it now. The LPSC merch at the time, I've seen pictures of it. it had like dinosaurs on it and stuff because they were all excited. About oh, really? It. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, then it wasn't this LPSC, the the, the, the boring <laughs> one. I need to get back to this person. Ask what was boring. Yeah, or, I'll see if I are you really not movie. into dinosaurs? He hates dinosaurs and wants planets. Crater uh, counting on planets, nothing else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, what are you what are you working on these days? What are you doing? So you're at um, ETH Zurich, right? Um, yep. Insights done. So, what's your job now? What are you What are you doing these days? <laughs> Tell us about your work. Uh, we're still wrapping up Insight. I mean, it's uh, uh, so there are three coincidentally early three grad students finishing within uh, two months now uh, who worked on uh, Insight stuff. So one. Uh, actually, a really clever guy doing for the first time machine learning in a way that actually pulled out 60% more quakes than we had seen before. Um, and before I was sort of, yeah, machine learning doesn't make sense. So many humans looked at this data and said, no, but he showed actually, wow. Okay. Sometimes when the wind just died down and there's a quake immediately afterwards, no human saw it, but his code saw it. Another one's actually uh, updating the, the crater counting on Mars, the new craters, basically with the seismometer. I'm really making, and we find actually that there seem to be more impacts happening on Mars than we thought before, probably because imaging is just so difficult sometimes in certain regions to discover new craters, while the seismometer hears these new these impacts. So um, that's the thing. And then, uh, yeah, and then there's discussion about the deep interior, whether there's an extra molten layer on top of the core, uh, deep in the mantle, which we don't have on Earth, which is, of course, in a way esoteric. But on the other side, it really shows us how much our understanding of planetary interiors is shaped by Earth. I mean, we always assume, uh, like, not entirely coincidentally, here I'm wearing this shirt, you're having one layer somewhere inside the inside the crust, then you have an interface to the crust, then you're having the core, and you're having an inner core. But it turns out on other planets, it's, it's different. It could uh, be different, yeah. And, different uh, planets, yeah. yeah. and we have 5,000 exoplanets where we have no idea about the interior, just an average density or so, and so we better really understand the two or three bodies in the solar system that we can get a hand on. Yeah. I'm still yeah, waiting so to find the planet that's full of Nutella. That's the one I'm looking for. <laughs> We don't know. It might be a Nutella <laughs> or a giant chestnut in the middle or something. Yeah. <laughs> or the one they and always then, talk about the one that's made out of diamonds. They're like, we're going to be so rich when we can. <laughs> like, oh my god! With Starship, we'll go there with Starship. We'll starship, we get all the diamonds. Yeah, just one hundred pounds of diamonds are down now. <laughs> Yeah, then we can really, yeah. Uh, yeah, there was the discussion on the Discord about what you do actually with so many diamonds and whether they're good building material or not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> probably not so much. Maybe you can no. burn them actually. No, it's not good for CO2 reasons. 
Yeah, then, um, and then the other thing, I mean, beyond insight, of course, uh, you may or may not have heard that a certain Swiss uh, former NASA employee uh, joined ETH um, as well. So um, Thomas Hoboken, um, after leaving NASA, decided uh, to return to Switzerland and home, um, yeah. yeah, came to Zurich for the first time. So he's from Bern, the, the capital and a much smaller city than Zurich. and. Zurich's biggest city in Switzerland, so everybody hates Zurich uh, outside. But uh, on the other hand, that's where ETH is, so the, the Federal Institute of Technology. And so, um, yeah, he came there, and it's really it's been a curious situation because even though Switzerland has a space industry, and for example, payload fairings for all ULA launches, for all European launches, they are actually built by a Swiss company, um, and partially in factory in the US, but uh, the European ones are actually built in Switzerland and then shipped on some crazy way out of the mountains uh, to uh, French, uh, to Kourou. Um, but uh, there was no um, no real um, faculty for space systems or aerospace engineering anywhere in Switzerland so far. And some people wanted to change that for a long time. And then basically with him coming in, um, there was a momentum of actually saying, oh, yeah, now let's do that. Let's just actually build a, a build, at least start with a, um, a, core, a, a master course in space system engineering. And um, of course, we need to start from from scratch. We we have we don't have that yet. But on the other hand, it gives us a chance to actually start with the space industry of 2024 and not uh, the one of 1948 when a lot of other uh, um, such faculties were founded, and so yeah, that's that's the other thing I'm currently doing. I'm developing that uh, that uh, master in space systems, and really trying to focus as one thing on system engineering because we feel that this is something that will become more important. There are a lot of engineers for subsystems, uh, for propulsion, everything, but the market, specifically the new space economy, will need more of the people with the system and understanding. And of course, it's something you often gain on the job over a few years, but can we actually maybe train the people to get that at university already? Another thing that we want to look into is data, um, I mean, data uh, during a design. Um, at least that's my understanding of one of the things that SpaceX is actually quite good at with their iterative design, just collecting tons and tons of data on every yeah, launch and then actually improving like quickly. Yeah. And, um, and that's, in a classical education, often not such a focus. Also data then from the perspective of using it, for example, for Earth observation, um, using it in the end to, I mean, what Planet is doing or what other startups are doing. Um, maybe also in a way of, yeah, trying to tackle a few of the problems we're having here on Earth, because that wouldn't be our third thing. Try to use space in a sustainable way and actually first maybe even understand what sustainable means in this case. Uh, is it what's the trade off between having a reusable rockets that on the other hand need more fuel? What's the trade off between having a, a constellation and making sure that the constellation gets out of the of Leo quickly and not pollute Leo, but on the other hand, blow all that stuff up in the upper atmosphere? There's been this paper recently where they said, oh, we, by now we find 30% of the stuff in the upper atmosphere is actually a re-entered uh, rocket stages and satellites, and only 70% is meteorites. Um, and so that's, ooh, we were, we were quite fast at reaching that number. And <laughs> that's, um, if you look at the curve of how much stuff is new in space, it needs to get down in the next year. So uh, well, that's a yeah. lot. That's not great. And, <laughs> and of course, I mean, sustainability is always a buzzword, and which is not great. But on the other hand, I mean, we need to be sustainable with the new space situation. And we need to at least get an understanding of what are the, 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 the dangerous things we shouldn't do and how we can avoid them. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the thing that in other contexts, a lot of people at ETH are thinking about. So that's something we want to build into that course. Actually. That sounds cool. And then, yeah. The first students arrive in summer, um, and um, yeah, let's see how they do. <laughs> well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, uh, Zerbukin helps you uh, whip that place into shape. It'll be, it'll be fun. So. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, <laughs> no, from, from what I hear, from what I hear, he's a great like talent developer, right? So um, should be should be good for you. No, yeah, that's what I hear. I heard too. Yeah. No, and it's uh, of course he's a he's a great and ruthless manager in uh, really looking at the situation and seeing. Um, Okay, wait, you told, talk, talked a lot about this 80% of the problem, uh, of the thing. Why didn't you talk about the 20% where a few red flags might be hiding? And he's really 
Well, he's really great at doing that, actually. And you're really fine. <laughs> oh shit, shit! This is where I, where I hit my red flags and um, my <laughs> problems. And yeah, yeah. it's that's always cool. good to have a manager that challenges you a little bit, right? So, mm. or a lot in some cases. True. I guess is the point. So, yeah. yeah, and then, then the other thing, of course, we're trying to. I mean, having talked about all this situation with uh, the roadblock that MSR is. I mean, even if it's a if it's a good thing, it's still a roadblock for a lot of missions. And of course, then there's Artemis, which is cool, but also uh, horrendously expensive. And so I'm just trying to think about, hey, where can we actually get small things in between? Um, for example, where does ESA have room for doing maybe a, a mission on Eclipse Lander, which officially they have not yet uh, announce that they'll do, but I mean, let, let's see, we're, at least we're hoping that before the big Argonaut lander in um, so this one and a half ton or more lander in uh, 32, I think, um, before that, yeah, at least get some European missions on a on intuitive, intuitive machines lander well, or not, this robotics right? like, lander. Just yeah, send, it's... You just send some payloads, just put them in the bucket in the Kmart. Yeah. Of, uh, of... <laughs> oh, yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, so that's the, well, that's the other thing we're so we, we identified a little, so we thought about what can you actually do on the moon? And of course, everybody wants to find volatiles these days. And so we decided to stay out of that crowded uh, part of the sandbox and look at lava tubes because in a way they are such a cool thing. And I mean, there are so many, there are so many concepts of course, the humans, uh, the astronauts should live in the lava tubes. And for that, we need uh, a crane and a, a caterpillar and everything. But then, then you look at these images and it's a, it's a small, opening, a 100 meter or 70 meter opening with big slopes around it. And it looks as if boulders fell into it. So you're not going to go there first with a big rover or humans even. And so there's a, there's a quite um, quite good here, a good group of um, leg robotics here, actually. Um, and so we're trying to develop a mission that has basically a, only a small um, leg robot that can actually walk to the rim, have some two physical instruments to see whether there's a tube below, how large that tube is, and maybe from imaging and some spectroscopic analysis also say, was it an impact that hit this tube and caused uh, the pit uh, that is now there, or did it collapse? How stable is it? Uh, and then do that before we go there with a big, uh, big rover and uh, big bulldozers and everything um, to enter. Hmm. Yeah, so that's cool. Love it. Let's see whether Isa would like that or somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> oh, man. Cool. Let's see. Well, uh, we're about wrapping up here. So, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. I, uh, I, I miss going to LPSC. I, uh, I mean, it doesn't quite make sense when I'm not doing We Martians to, to, for that expense because it's not cheap even for, for being mm. so close to it. It's not cheap for me to go there. And, not, no, no. The, I feel like those hotels get more expensive every year, which is mm. uh, wild, but... Um, so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad to hear, here it went, it sounds like it went exactly the way it always does. Just like, just <laughs> an absolute dump truck full of science that you just cannot consume in any manageable way. And, and a little bit of, a little bit of budget drama and a little bit of, a uh, little bit of, um, you know, on the ground organizing. That's about, that sounds about right for LPSC. <laughs> but that's what it's good for. And it's it is, yeah. great, but I... <laughs> I agree. The hotels are too expensive and the, the roads are crazy and uh, everything. <laughs> but you do get food trucks. True, we have food trucks now. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I noticed that there's a huge shopping mall in walking distance north, of, which is the, the least Texas thing imaginable because it's very upscale. And uh, for example, there's a Swiss chocolate store that, that sells chocolate for $100 per kilogram or something. That, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, Whether they find the customers in Texas. <laughs> Bring it with you when you go there and sell it to the true, store for market. You could probably get a pretty, good, pretty good deal. You could yeah, <laughs> make, a little, make a few bucks to pay off the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> good, po good point. I'll write that down. All right. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, before we go, I wanted to share uh, a new project I'm working on. Um, so uh, I started blogging, and there is now a blog with a blog post up here ready for you to see. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a lot of plans for this, um, but you can go to jakerobbins.com and it's just got all my random thoughts, space included. Uh, this first thing here is, uh, it's about intuitive machines actually, talking about clips. So talking about the lander and kind of exploring the idea of success because I find that um, 
you know, defining success in a space mission is very mm. complex these days. Mm. It's not like it, it worked or it didn't. It's not true anymore. So mm. um, I wrote this little piece here to talk about kind of the, some of the things that uh, that I'm thinking about and talk a little bit about our Discord, which uh, you are a part of. So if uh, members mm. want to come and hang out with us for five bucks a month, I talk about you in here. You get Discord members get quoted in this article. Oh my God, what did I open? Yeah, not, not to, to, you, to, but... to, to be honest, <laughs> on, on Discord, I'm doing a lot more shit posting than I should. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Um, no, but this was actually a great just... blend of shit posting and actual information, by the way. So. <laughs> but it, it, it's a great topic because, I mean, even at LPSC, uh, I mean, this morning um, we were thinking about, uh, hey, should we drive down to Boca Chica and of, to see the launch? And of course, we didn't do it because it's seven hours. Apparently, a few people at midnight decided to do it and walked from the bar to their car and drove down there. I heard. <laughs> Rumors <laughs> that, that some people <laughs> did it, Down but anyway, um, yeah. then, then, then we watched, and everybody, of course, watched the launch, and, and we were so excited about it. And then I ran into one guy who said, "Oh, Elon's rocket exploded again." Huh. And, what? That doesn't make sense. I mean, really, did you? That's the thing you took away from this, uh, from all of this, that the rocket exploded again. It's not working. <laughs> We should go with SLS uh, or something. Anyway. Yeah. Well, that's, that's literally the exact uh, topic of this, right? So trying to ex separate the ideas of, of, of um, uh, objectives, right? Like you have mission objectives, you have program mm. objectives, you have technical objectives, there are all these kind of different stakeholder objectives to look at these. And some of them are successful and some of them aren't. And you have to take all that into a, account to figure it out. So yeah, there's cool. some, some thoughts there. But. Looking forward to read that. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thanks again, uh, Simon, for coming on. It's good to talk to you again. Uh, I don't know what's happening next, everybody. Uh, next week, I am away and Anthony is back. And I just, I literally have no idea what the plan is. So stay tuned for, for news on the next episode. But uh, other than that, we've got some great stuff coming up in April. Um, but I will be uh, in Ontario next week for the eclipse. And if you are uh, in the area and you want to come and hang out with me to uh, you know, see the, see the eclipse and maybe have a beer. Uh, I will be around there. So I've got this uh, up on offnom.com slash events. This is our eclipse 24 meetup. Uh, so Sunday, April 7th, and you can come hang out with me. I uh, have a beer the night before. Um, I would love to see you there and, uh, hopefully we have a good time. So yeah, that's it, everybody. Uh, have a great, uh, great day and we'll talk to you later. Ciao.